welcome to another review by Fat Ninja Studios. I'm your host, Jackie Kay, and today we are being whisked away by The Eternals, the next major film in the MCU series. Before we break it all down, please give the video a like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget to blast that bell icon to stay up to date with our latest releases. Major spoiler warning ahead. The film begins with some lore, spelling out the creation of the Celestials and the Eternals. We watch as Ajak is awakened and summoned by their creator, Ereshem, shortly before arriving at Earth in the year 5000 BC. Down on Earth in Mesopotamia, a group of villagers near a beach are attacked by beasts known as Deviants. We flash forward to present day London, where Cersei meets with Dane giving a lecture about the history of apex predators, when suddenly an earthquake shakes up the entire building. Later that evening, Cersei and Dane celebrate his birthday, along with Sprite, when they are attacked by a deviant creature. Icarus shows up in the nick of time to save them, though, as the creature scampers away to safety. Having thought all the deviants to have been vanquished, they decide to visit Ajak and discover that she has been slain. This prompts the three Eternals to find their brethren, and we are treated to more flashbacks. In ancient Babylon, we see the whole team battling deviants and protecting the humans. They are almost worshipped as gods among the common folk, yet it seems that the millennia of battles have grown weary on them all. We see how Icarus and Circe fall in love, and more relationships bloom between the other members. During the invasion of Tenochtitlan by conquistadors, Fina is triggered and comes out swinging at the rest of her teammates before Gilgamesh is ultimately able to subdue her with a hard punch to the face. An argument breaks out between the others as Drug becomes more angry having to watch so many senseless wars and genocides and not being able to get involved in human affairs due to the decree by Erisha. Ajak decides then to split the team up and let everyone live their lives thinking that all the deviants were gone and until further orders from Erisha are given they should be free. We cut back to present day and meet up with Kingo and his valet. For the past few generations, he's been a Bollywood star, pretending to be the next of kin for each new decade. They tell him about the death of Ajak, and then set off to Australia to find Gilgamesh and Fina. Fina still suffers from memory fractures, so Gilgamesh has stayed by her side since they left Babylon. He has become quite the chef, and treats everyone to an extravagant meal. Here they discuss what has happened and what they're going to do now, when Cersei decides to get some fresh air. Connecting to this cosmic orb device that's in her chest, she is able to contact Erishem and finds out the plan for Earth. Apparently, he deposited seeds into various planets, and the seeds will finally be born once the life population of any given planet has reached a peak. The seed will then absorb all the energy from all the living beings on said planet, and a new celestial will arise, destroying the entire planet in the process. It's also told to her that the Deviants were originally created by the Celestials as well, to kill off any predators and ensure the rise of intelligent life. But when they evolved and then revolted, the Eternals were created to be the next Guardians and take out the Deviants. Since they are technically machines, they cannot die, and after each Celestial is born, the Eternals' memories are stripped from them and housed in some interstellar space station for research. Cersei cannot believe what she has heard, and of course she immediately informs the rest of the group. They decide that they need to find the remaining two members and hold a consensus on what to do next. Drug has built himself a small civilization in the Amazon, while Faustos has settled down with his husband and adopted son living in a small American suburb. Last but not least is Makari, who I guess has been living on their ship the entire time stealing random artifacts? Of all the characters, she got the least character development 
and I find that unfortunate. While at Druk's settlement, they are again attacked by deviants. The same one that attacked them in London is also here, and he seems to have the ability to heal himself, which he must have absorbed from Ajax. Vina goes into a trigger state, and Gilgamesh attempts to defend her, but is killed in the process, the creature absorbing all of his ability as well. Icarus fights it off, and they manage to kill a few of the others. When they finally all regroup at the ship, most are in agreement to stop the Celestial from being born and destroying the planet. They don't want to kill it, but perhaps use Droog's ability to pacify it and keep it sleeping. This is where the tables turn. We learn that Icarus has known about all of this since Babylon and has kept everyone in the dark. When Ajax began to want to save humanity, he turned on her, fed her to the Deviants, and tried using them to distract the other Eternals long enough for the birth of Tiamat to happen. Meanwhile, Fastos came up with a plan to create a Unimind, which would combine their powers like Captain Planet to take on the Celestial. A fight breaks out, Sprite joins with Icarus, Kingo just leaves, and the rest begin to put their plan in action. At a volcanic island in the Indian Ocean, the last big showdown occurs. Druid, Makari, and Cersei try to get the Unimind going before being interrupted by Icarus. Makari runs him off, delivering a very awesome beatdown on him, and Cersei is forced to try to make it to the emergence point so that she can have physical contact with the Celestial to try to kill it through transmutation. The last living Deviant also joins in the fight, so it's a bit of a standoff for a while before Thena breaks off and fights the Deviant in a cave. She lets herself be taken temporarily, the creature trying to absorb her abilities, but she ends up snapping out of it and slices him into big meat chunks. Back on the battlefield, Fastos uses his clever devices to hold down Icarus while Tiamat begins to emerge. Cersei uses her ability to turn it into ice, when Icarus breaks free and goes to attack her. However, he cannot bring himself to kill her, as he's still in love with her, and joins the Unimind instead, giving her the strength to kill Tiamat. Tiamat becomes an ice continent, and Icarus flies himself into the sun. No, literally, he flies into the sun, presumably killing himself, but we didn't definitively see him die. Then again, they could come back as they're just machines with downloaded memories. So, who knows? Just before the credits roll, Cersei goes to visit Dane. They declare each other's love for one another when she is suddenly plucked off Earth by Ereshem. And he says he won't destroy the Earth for now because he's curious why they defended the planet and saved it in the first place. Makari, Druig, and Thena leave Earth on their ship to find the other Eternals and encounter Star Fox, Thanos' brother. Fastos goes back to his family and Sprite is made human and adopted by Kingo so she can grow up and experience a full life. There is one more after credits scene in which we see Dane opening up a box. Inside is the Ebony Blade, which foreshadows him becoming the Black Knight. It calls to him, like creepy little voices calling to him. But just before he's able to pick it up, he's interrupted by a louder, more firm voice asking him if he's sure that he really wants to do that. <laughs> film was pretty good, but it felt oddly paced. It would have been better suited as one of the Disney Plus series, with each episode having been dedicated to what each individual Eternal was up to for the 7,000 years that they were on Earth. The film, however, does open the wider Marvel Cosmic Universe, and while it doesn't spill out everything that's to come in the future, duh. It hints that there is a major war brewing between the Celestials and the Cosmic Entities. Personally, I believe that the Celestials lied to the Eternals once again, 
but this time lied about expanding the universe and instead are raising an army. Going back to Guardians of the Galaxy 2, however, it somehow makes more sense that Ego was supposed to be a celestial, but as a birth defect, he became the planet instead of emerging from it. The post credit scenes also set up Black Knight, and even more importantly, the Ebony Blade, which will most likely also serve as the Black Necro Sword in Thor Love and Thunder, when Gore gets his hands on it. I'm not quite sure if it was Nick Fury speaking to Dane at the end, but it also kind of sounded like Doctor Strange, which would make sense given that the sword can kill anything and could possibly be used against Shumagora. The biggest deviation from the comics is that they basically gave Arishem all of the tasks that were otherwise divided amongst the many other Celestials. And then of course there's Star Fox, which was a cool post credit stinger, but since they didn't really dive into Thanos' heritage of being half eternal himself, it'll leave the average viewer mighty confused. The deviants in the film also didn't really amount to much. Whether as a major antagonist or the progenitor of what is to become mutants on Earth. Rather, they were relegated to just being cannon fodder. And I think this is a huge missed opportunity. I'm gonna give the film a 7 out of 10. It was gorgeous, and there were characters that I thought were really interesting. Personally, I wanted to see more of Makari and the close knit bond between her and Droog with romances and friendships being a big part of this film. I also wonder if we will see Ajak or Gilgamesh again, since their bodies could just easily be reconstructed and their memories downloaded again. We have more theories, but we're going to save those for our full in-depth MCU Phase 4 predictions video. I want to thank you for checking out our video. Please be sure to like the video, share it, and subscribe to our channel. If you'd like to reach out to us, you can do so on Twitter, at StudiosFat, or on Discord, linked below in the description. We also have a Patreon and would welcome any donations, so please check it out. It's also linked below. I've been your host, Jackie Kay. And before I go, it's not always easy to do the right thing. Even what looks like the only choice can still have negative consequences. You've got to trust yourself to make the best choices, though. It is better to do something than stand by and do nothing at all. Don't be afraid to stand up for what you think is right. In the meantime, be kind and take care.